Um, your basic epoxide synthesis is starting with MCPBA, and it's almost always written out as MCPBA. Okay. The other option is that they may reference it as a peroxy acid. So instead of saying MCPBA, they just say peroxy acid. Same deal. Okay. Uh, the other form I've seen is that they will actually go through and provide the entire structure of MCPBA. Okay. Uh, I think I've even seen one version where they went through and just got rid of the chlorine, okay, depending on the years. So again, when you look at your chemistries, what you should be focusing on is where's the reactive part of your molecule? Keep your focus there. The rest of that structure, benzene or chlorine, is irrelevant. Keep your focus on the parts of the molecule that are relevant to chemistry occurring. Okay. Um, those will result in an epoxide. Okay. How many epoxides do we get when we run this reaction? We end up getting two because we have alkenes reacting. Alkenes react from both above and below. So we always have the possibility of two products. You need to look at that product and say, does it matter? In this case, it's a little vague. Nothing's being labeled on it. So we could probably get away with just saying there's one product, okay? even though we still have both attacks possible. Once we've formed the epoxide, we can then go through and react it. Depending on the conditions we run the reaction under, we get different products. Okay, and I'll un-erase that in a second. If we run under basic or neutral conditions, we have an interesting dilemma. Okay? The biggest dilemma of which is that while we have a strained epoxide or a strained three-membered ring, do we have a good leaving group? Okay, no. If that pops off, we end up with O minus. And we've seen O minus before. Uh, let's just not worry about what that piece is. O minus is a bad leaving group because it's charged. It's charged right? That's one big aspect. It's also a strong base. We want something to act as a leaving group that has no reactivity. Okay? So our oxide or our oxygen as a leaving group is a horrible, horrible option. So if we're looking at a ring opening, what we want to do is think about the quality of the leaving group. If it is a good quality leaving group, that's going to change the dynamics of the reaction. If it's a bad leaving group, we get different results. In this case, we're running, un running under a bad leaving group situation. Okay. Well, if it's a bad leaving group, how can I force it to leave? Okay. I could potentially make it better, but that then changes the conditions I'm running under, basic or neutral. Okay. So I cannot change the leaving group in, under these circumstances. And you're right, we will look at that in a second. Someone breaks into your house and camps out in your house. Okay. They are now a bad leaving group. They aren't going to leave. How do you get them to leave your house? Tell them to go to your neighbor's house. <laughs> Throw your neighbor under the bus is a bit not the nicest. Force them out. Okay. If they're being angry, obnoxious, and violent, and you don't want to deal with them, you could call somebody out. You could call your neighbor to come and force them out of your house. You need to bring in a stronger thing to force them out, which means what do we end up having to react with? A strong nucleophile. How do we know it's strong? We're looking for that charge. Okay. So we're now forcing our leaving group to leave by adding a stupidly strong nucleophile. What is the issue with adding a stupidly strong nucleophile and forcing that to now leave? Uh, could act as a base. Okay. Where I was going with that question is where does it attack? Okay. It's going to attack from the back side of our leaving group bond, but where do we have leaving group bonds? There's a red one and purple one now in this case. Which of those is the correct leaving group? Okay. This comes from that forcing of the reaction to occur. 
right? We're using a strong nucleophile. And when we use strong nucleophiles, we do backside attacks at the least substituted. Why the least substituted? Less steric hindrance. There's less electron bulk getting in the way, which then means our nucleophile comes in from our least substituted position, causes our leaving group to leave, and we would end up with the charge structure shown below. What is the arrangement of the oxygen versus our nucleophile? They are anti. They are on opposite sides of our ring structure, or they are on opposite sides of our starting alkene, if we go all the way back to the alkene. We have to make sure that our structure shows that. Okay. One of the things that can get a bit obnoxious with this is that I could just as easily have shown this structure like this. With all my lone pairs. What is different about it? Sure looks like it's cis, but I could have easily just rotated the bond. So be very careful when you look at your epoxide ring openings. It is very common, balance, for them to go through and do the nucleophilic attack and then draw the final answer, your multiple choice answer, with a bond rotation, making it look like it's doing a cis versus a trans, or cis versus sin versus anti-additions. Okay, so be very, very careful when looking at those final answers to make sure you've got the proper alignment. If it looks like they're starting to exchange the locations of side groups okay, or other substituents, that's when you should immediately pause because that's your red flag that that's what they're doing to you and they're trying to trick you. So just watch out for that. Does we going to be going to cis or trans if there is a double bond? Do we have cis or trans in our final product? No. Okay, so we can't evaluate cis or trans officially because there is no double bond. This is why we have to be thinking sin versus anti-additions. Okay. Whoops. After we've done our nucleophilic attack, do we have a final product? No. What's wrong with it? Charge on the oxygen. So what do we have to do? We have to add a hydrogen. Where do we get the hydrogen from? Okay. This is where we run into questions on how we approach this. Typically, it's getting added in a second step of adding maybe water, something as benign as water. More typically, you'll see it added as H+. Plus. Okay, and we'd end up with our final answer, where we have the alcohol. Okay. Why are we adding it as a second step? Okay. We have to run this in two steps. Remember. What does our nucleophile potentially act as? A base. If I add a strong acid at the same time I'm adding the nucleophile, I cancel the nucleophile and I'm going to get a different result. Okay? So it's typically shown as a two-step reaction. I made a typo when building up the, the image and haven't had time to go back and fix it. Okay? So this is a better way to go through and show that. If you're lucky, sometimes maybe the solvent will act as your... Uh, acid in your second step, and it's weak enough that it doesn't ruin the whole conditions. Okay? What can that nucleo nucleophile be? Really anything with electrons. That's it. And that's why it's being shown generically as NUC and not, say, as hydroxide, okay? or ethoxide, or acetylide, okay? or amide. Tons of possible nucleophiles can come in and attack. Okay. What happens under, uh, hold up, not under basic conditions or acidic conditions, ignore that for the moment. If we take a look at the other drawing that I've got next to it, what is the intent of that side? It's just a different view on the orientation of the molecule helping to accent the fact that your uh, oxygen from your epoxide and your nucleophile are on opposite sides of the structure. Okay. So all it is is a rotation of the structure to get a slightly different viewpoint on it. Okay. Structure on the left, the epoxide's in the plane of the paper. Structure on the right, the epoxide is actually coming out of the board. Okay, that's it. 
What happens when we look at acidic conditions? Well, under acidic conditions, what's the most reactive thing? H plus. Okay? So if H plus is the most reactive thing, then I need to have that H plus get neutralized. What do I have that could neutralize that H plus? Electrons. electrons. Where are there electrons? Oxygen. On the oxygen of the epoxide and potentially the nucleophile. Okay. We won't reference a carbon in the epoxide. Is that where you're going with it? Okay. Why are the carbons in the epoxide not a good source of electrons for the hydrogen? Mm, full octets doesn't work for me. What are they connected to? A more electronegative atom. By being attached to a more electronegative atom, do they have more electrons or less electrons? Less. less. Okay. So by identifying that bond polarity, you can start to recognize that you can't generate a negative charge on the carbons. It has to be up on the oxygen. Okay. So our electrons from the oxygen can share with our hydrogen, and we would end up with our first intermediate. And we'd be wrong. What's wrong with it? Okay. We need the charge. Does oxygen want to be positively charged? No. What have we now done with that first single step? We've now made a great leaving group. Oxygen does not want to be po positively charged, so it starts to leave the structure. It cannot leave the structure on its own, okay, but it's starting to break away from the structure. Which bond should I be looking at? The red bond or the purple bond? Okay, why the red bond? If our leaving group is starting to leave, what does it leave behind? Positive charge. Where is the positive charge most stable? Our red carbon, because it is more substituted. As it starts to leave the structure, we start to see the formation of a carbocation. Before we can officially form the carbocation, what happens? The nucleophile can come in and attack. What is an interesting feature of this nucleophile? It's not charged. We're looking at a weak nucleophile. Okay. Once it's gone through and attacked, uh, there it is. We end up with our final product. Notice again, where's the <laughs> nucleophile relative to the oxygen? Okay. They're still in that anti-confirmation. Okay. We are doing an anti-addition. This has to do with that three-membered transition state, or that three-membered intermediate. Okay. We have to do a backside attack. We have to get those anti. What's the other thing that's an interesting feature of this? Our nucleophile went to a different location than under our basic conditions. Our nucleophile is now at the most substituted position as opposed to the least substituted. Okay. So a subtle change in the conditions drastically alters the results of the product we get. We end up putting the nucleophile in an entirely different location. Okay. So it's recognizing how the conditions alter what happens as you move through. This is something that you can straight up memorize all the way through, or you address the chemistries. Acid is more reactive. Neutralize the acid. Oh, I've got a great leaving group. Nucleophile needs to attack in such a way that I can get that leaving group out faster. Okay? Kind of makes sense? We still get the anti-addition. We just get the addition happening at the other carbon of our epoxide. Questions about that? So, now we'll move into kind of our strict oxidation reactions. Uh, these get a bit messy, and you'll notice in all, almost all of these that we see a very heavy usage of metal ions. Metals are fantastic because they are very good at transferring electrons. That's why we use them in our walls to transfer electrons. Okay? That's their whole kind of goal in life. 
So they're good at that electron transfer, which is going to be necessary because when we do an oxidation reaction, what happens? We lose electrons. Well, what did we lose those electrons to? Something has to accept those electrons. What ends up accepting them? Very typically, our metal. Okay. So now the question becomes, is how do these species work? Okay. Well, let's take a look at the active metal in each case. We've got osmium tetroxide, and we have potassium permanganate. Does the potassium do much anything? No. Why not? Why does it want to be by itself? An ionic bond, I'll accept that. Group 1 metal, very similar to sodium. Okay. So your group 1 metals aren't involved. What do we have as a commonality between MnO4 and OSO4? They all have four oxygens. What are we resulting in? We're taking a metal, and we're putting it at the center of four oxygens. The exact structure has some variability with it, but very typically we end up generating a negatively charged oxygen on one end of this. Okay. That negatively charged oxygen could potentially react as a nucleophile. The metal has three electronegative or four electronegative oxygens pulling on it, which means the metal starts to carry what charge? Positive. Does it want to be positive? Not really, so it starts to pull on electrons. Where can it pull on electrons? One of the outside oxygens. If we start to pull those electrons out, what happens to that oxygen? It starts to become positively charged, which then means we have an electrophile. What is interesting about both permanganate and osmium tetroxide, and officially our alkenes, they're both active nucleophiles and electrophiles. So the alkene will coordinate to the oxygens of our metal oxide to form a fancy five-membered ring. Can I show that? Yes. Interesting feature. Notice that I'm showing wedges out to those oxygens. What's that? It's a syn addition. Why is it a syn addition? Okay. We will very likely see this happening at the same time. Could it possibly wedged and dashed? No. Okay. The geometry of that structure is not going to allow one bond down and one bond up, much like the epoxides, the bromonium ions, the mercuronium ions. All of those are going through and forming some kind of ring structured intermediate. It is how that ring structured intermediate falls apart that generates our other products. So both of those oxygens were actually positives? One acts as a positive, one acts as a negative. So there were two negative oxygens? Because we still have negative oxygen. So I drew one as a negative oxygen, and the other one I showed as a positive oxygen in the drawing. Okay. So our alkene will share electrons with the positive oxygen forming a carbocation, the negative oxygen will react with the carbocation to form out, flesh out the other half of that structure. We end up seeing a big shift in our balance and electrons move from the pi bond out to now forming this five-membered ring. The exact charge state of the oxygens that are not directly involved in the ring, don't stress about. Okay. That is going to be dependent on the charge state of whatever the metal is. Okay. So permanganate and osmium both have different charge states or oxidation states. They're going to be changing the charges of those oxygens. And depending on the conditions we're under, we'll see those charges fluctuate as well. Okay. This is one of the reasons why the mechanisms through here become a big mess. So then what happens? 
Okay, we do still have a negative oxygen. Okay, what could that negative oxygen do? Okay, it could potentially donate electrons back into the metal, but then what ends up happening? The metal gains too many electrons, so what has to happen then? Okay, it's going to have to push out <coughs> electrons. It could do resonance with the other oxygen. We still end up with a negative oxygen, so that doesn't do much for us. What else could it do? It could shuttle the electrons between the metal and the oxygen to the oxygen. The metal accepts too many electrons. Then you'd have a negative oxygen. What could you do with that negative oxygen? You could add acid. Okay, or under our other circumstance. Okay, so we can end up cleaving the metal structure off, okay, generating our dials. And a lot of that is going to depend on the conditions that you run under. When we look at the osmium tetroxide, we end up following it up with pretty much anything. For the most part, if you see osmium tetroxide, make it the cis dial. Don't worry about the rest of the reagents, for the most part. Your textbook addresses one more reagent, which uh, I might have a slide on. Okay, but if you see osmium tetroxide, just draw it out as the cis dial. That's what they're expecting you to draw. Okay? And a lot of that has to do with how quickly that structure can fall apart. Okay? Notice that the oxygens will still be on the same side. That's a direct result of how the metal coordinates to the alkene. Did the metal have to coordinate to the alkene from above? Nope. It could have done it from below. Either way, it's still a syn addition, but we're going to end up with two possible products. Okay. Questions? So we got a vague understanding of how we get the dials. How do we get the next step? one. Reconnect. Of course, we'll swing the electrons down to this oxygen, but now what's the problem? The octet on the carbon has now been exceeded, so what has to happen? Those electrons then go out to that oxygen, but now what's the problem? You've exceeded the octet where? On the oxygen. So how do we fix that exceeded octet? Electrons go to the metal. The end result is what? Two carbonyls. What happened to the bond in between the carbons of our double bond? completely broken, and we end up turning them out into carbonyls. Interesting feature of that is that what is shown as the product? No. What's going on? Okay, we're missing another oxygen. What does permanganate do? It's an oxidizing agent. It is a stupidly strong oxidizing agent. When we're under acidic and concentrated conditions with enough heat, we can cleave that bond open and it gets oxidized a second time. Why can we oxidize that position a second time? Hydrogen. There is still a hydrogen attached there. So I can go through and do a second oxidation. The exact mechanism of that is a complex one that we'll talk about in second semester vaguely. It's not really worth the trouble right now, okay, unless you really want to see it. Okay. With a lot of these oxidation reactions, it is really going to come back to you are just responsible for knowing these reactions. This is what happens. Okay. Syn addition, you can get your dials, or if you go under hot concentrated conditions, erase the double bond entirely, put in some oxygens, make yourself happy.
Ready for kind of a shortcut on making the double bonds? Redraw the structure with a really, really long double bond. And all you gotta do is erase the middle of it, put in some oxygens. Is there a hydrogen still out there? Yeah, so clean that up a little bit and add an oxygen. What if there's multiple double bonds? Do it to all of them. One exception? Benzene. Why is benzene an issue? The benzene is not an alkene. Each of those double bonds does resonance, which stabilizes them, makes them less reactive to permanganate. Okay? And so they end up not reacting out. Okay? So again, you need to know the reagents, what they end up forming. That is the big lesson out of this section. Um, do you really want a mechanism? I don't think I gave a mechanism. Yeah, I didn't. Okay. Um, if you see permanganate and hot, okay, this is what I just talked about. Stretch the double bond. Okay. Replace the carbons of your double bond with oxygen. And then replace any hydrogen with an OH. What do I get for a product? Stupidly long double bond. Hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Erase the middle out. Oxygen, oxygen. I had a hydrogen up there, so I can make that an oxygen. Hydrogen up there, so I can make that an oxygen. Hydrogen down there, so I can make that an oxygen. Kind of make sense? What did I just make? Two products, and the one in the box is? Carbox, or carbonic acid which immediately decomposes into CO2 and water. Okay. So that is a trick one on that. Sometimes you'll see a terminal alkene go through and do these reactions and you'll all of a sudden see a carbon disappear from your products. It didn't disappear, it became CO2. Right, and depending on who you talk to, CO2 isn't considered organic. Okay. Questions on that one? Okay. Ozone is our last big one. Ozone does a similar type reaction. Because if we look at our Lewis structure for ozone... We end up with all sorts of nasty charges in this, positive, negative. Does our oxygen want to be positive? What happens? Starts to steal electrons from the pi bond, which then means what happens to our terminal oxygen? Starts to become positive, so what happens? Take electrons from our alkene, but then the alkene has a positive charge, what happens? The negative oxygen can share back to form our five-membered ring again. Anybody have any issues with that structure? What's that? So number one, it's not what's drawn. Okay, what else might be an issue with it? We have two oxygen-oxygen bonds. What do we say about oxygen-oxygen bonds? 
incredibly unstable. We've got a structure that is very, very unstable, and it goes through a nasty, though interesting, mechanism of bond breaking and bond formation to eventually get you to the pseudo-stable structure that's shown on the left. Okay. That structure is now stable enough that depending on the conditions we follow up our ozone reaction with, we can get different results. If we go under oxidative conditions, we end up with the most oxidized state. What is familiar about that product? Same thing as permanganate. We get the exact same result. If we follow it up under reductive conditions, okay, by adding a sulfur compound, dimethyl sulfide, okay, we end up not going to fully oxidized, and instead of bland, Instead of fully oxidizing, we leave our hydrogen there. A common question comes out of this is, what is the other product that comes up with this? Okay. Well, there is a third oxygen, right, from ozone. Where did that third oxygen go? That's why we needed our dimethyl sulfide. Guess what it does? It scavenges that oxygen, and we end up with Dimethyl sulfoxide, super exciting. There it is. Okay. So you will sometimes see that referenced as DMS, sometimes as DMSO as a side product. Okay. That third oxygen has to get picked up by something. That's the role of DMS. So this is, again, one of those reactions you just kind of have to know the end result. You'll see ozone followed by certain conditions. Okay. Very, very rarely, in fact, I think so rarely it doesn't get asked, will you see them show the five-membered intermediate. Okay. Whoops. Those of you interested in the mechanism, I mean, it's kind of cool. Do some kind of crazy arrow pushing <coughs> all the way through. Okay. So if you're really interested in it, you can go ahead and take a look at it. Um, for those of you super interested and poke around at that mechanism, you'll notice that you can get a variety of different products coming out of it. Okay? Not just the most common product shown. Okay? You can get all sorts of weird results. So, like it or not, pretty much all of your oxidation reactions are memorized ones. You need to know them. Okay? Ozone is primarily defined as its oxidizing agent. Your unstable intermediate, okay? If we go into reductive conditions, we take DMS and convert it to DMSO. Okay? We can split the alkene and make our oxygens. It's our primary focus. Okay? Or add your oxygen, oxygens. Oxidatively, uh, I have seen it shown just on its own. I've seen it shown in the presence of water, and I've seen it shown in the presence of peroxide. Okay? So those secondary conditions, if it's going under oxidative, can be a, a wide smattering. If you're going under reductive conditions, you'll see DMS almost undoubtedly. Okay. Pretty much just repeat the reductive mechanism, except any hydrogen that is potentially reducible okay, or oxidizable, convert to an OH, and that's the end of it. Okay. Those of you who aren't satisfied with that, I'm sorry, you can talk to me after class. We'll go through it in a lot more detail. Other than that, you really just need to know the reagents. Which leads us to the next fun part. We've got one, two, three, four, five questions. Uh, and I don't actually want to ask a quiz on this. I'm going to make up a quiz in the next slide. Um, so spend a few minutes. Five questions. I'll give you ten minutes. It's a little bit longer than you'd have on the final per question. Go through and get these questions answered. Once you think you... So if we take a look at our answers, we should be going D... C, C, oh crap, uh, I'm going to whittle that down to real quickly, B or D, I'll worry about it later in a second, uh, and then five, we have A. Hi. 
speed with which you answer these, it's two minutes. I mean, two minutes is long. You get about a minute and a half per question to solve, okay? Which means after you've spent a minute, you need to make it, a, I would actually argue even less than that, probably 30 seconds. 30 seconds, you read the question, you're like, holy crap, I have no clue. Stop working on the question, okay? Because if you have no clue, all you're going to do is burn more time off the clock that you could have spent on a different question. Okay. How many of you read every single question? Okay. You need to know all of the questions before you start answering. If you immediately start with question number one, and that's a hard question, <coughs> you're going to burn all of your time on that one question, and odds are it's a hard question. You weren't going to get it right anyway. Okay. So move on. Admittedly, all of these questions, I would argue, are on the high, harder side of the questions on the exam because they're all involving reagents and reactions, particularly re reagents and reactions that we just talked about, okay, that you've had a week to prepare for. Okay? So let's now take a closer look at what's going on with these. Uh, I think I'm a, I may regret that. So let's take a look at that first question. What's the most reactive thing present? You have HCl. So when you see that question, what you should immediately be doing is saying H+. Plus. Okay. What does the H plus need to react with? The electrons from our alkene, okay. which is then going to generate what? A carbocation, placing the carbocation where? At the tertiary position. Okay. With that, I would probably stop because I personally would then say, well, I've got a chloride that I could potentially hook up and draw in there. The chloride needs to attach. Okay. I'd go through and compare, and right away, hopefully, I'd see that D is the only answer that I've got. Okay. If you look at it and say, oh, I have no clue what's going on. Whoops, that was definitely the wrong eraser. So if you come across a question, you have no clue what's going on. Number one, identify the most reactive thing. Okay. Same steps. The most reactive thing should be the acid, H+. Plus. You now need to find what? Electrons. electrons. Okay. If you don't find electrons somewhere else, that's fine. Just say you can't figure it out. Look at your answer choices. In answer choice A, where are they getting electrons from? What change to go from our drawing up top to answer choice A? Pi bond. Pi bond. Oh, what's a pi bond? Electrons. electrons. Okay. The pi bond is going to react with H+. There are electrons there. I accept that as a possibility. Okay. What are they doing in B? Same thing. What do they do in C? They have the terminal carbon react with the chloride that had nothing to do with my most reactive thing. What? Exactly. That is now wrong. Okay? It's about trying to come up with a way to eliminate answers. What happened in D? Reacted with the alkene. Okay? So no clue. Minimally, gen chem, sorry, you have to know some chemistry. Acid, H+, plus, I need electrons. Oh, I don't know where there are electrons. Look at my answer choices. Double bond. Okay? Now it's a question of the double bond and how the double bond reacts with that positive hydrogen. Okay? You still need to have some structural analysis and say, okay, where do I put the hydrogen? Okay. What happens if I look at A and B? Where did they place the hydrogen? They placed the hydrogen in both A and B. at the most substituted, and then put the chlorine at the other location. So is, what's the difference between A and B? Anti versus sin. Okay, well, if H plus is the only thing that's reactive, what are the odds I'm doing anti versus sin anything? That's starting to get a little bit weird. Okay? So I might eliminate A and B just because something is fishy about how they're doing that reaction. They're putting the positive hydrogen 
at what is arguably the most positive carbon. That seems a little weird to me. Okay. So I may not like the answer, but then I'd go with D. So it's a question of reasoning through. They aren't asking you necessarily, do you know the answer outright? How do you think, and how do you think fast? Right? Which for those of you who think slow, I know, sorry. There isn't a whole lot else I've got for you on that one. Question two. All sorts of things came out of this one. What is the product of that reaction? Again, most reactive thing. We'd probably go with the pi bond here. The pi bond acts as a source of electrons. Where do I have a source of positive charge? Okay. We really only have the bromine. There is a possibility for the hydrogen, okay. which would mean I'd be adding a hydrogen to my structure. Do any of my answers show hydrogen being added to the double bond? No. no. So even if I like hydrogen being my positive, it's not hydrogen because it's not there. Okay. That means it's got to be bromine. Okay. The other option is it could be the carbon, but again, carbon's not an answer. So it's got to be the bromine somehow reacting with this. Okay. Hopefully at this point, you'd be like, bromine, that would mean I'd form a carbocation. Oh, I can't form a carbocation with that very large bromine. That means I'm forming the bromonium ion. What's special about the bromonium ion? It is what? Yeah, three-membered ring. Does it want to be a three-membered ring? No. no. So this is dying to bust open. What else is special about it? Positive charge where? Does bromine want to be positively charged? What have we just found? An exceptional leaving group. Good leaving group means the nucleophile attacks... So we're hearing some substitution arguments. So I go back and I look at the positions of my carbons and I go, jerks. They're the exact same substitution for both. Well, that doesn't help. So why were you thinking substitution? Because it's not necessarily most and least substituted. There's a very particular reason why we've been thinking most and least substituted. Which carbon is most positive charge? It's the stabilization of the carbocation. The more substituted stabilizes a carbocation better. That's why we say most substituted. Okay? You need to understand the why, not just the rule. The rule gets you set up to now being kind of screwed. Understanding why of the rule becomes important, which then means my nucleophile will come in and attack where? Wherever I form the most stable carbocation. Well, where is there a more stable carbocation? Secondary versus secondary. Ooh, that's right. They're about the same. The answer to all questions, why? Resonance. Resonance stabilizes what I'll now color our purple carbon, which then means our nucleophile attacks that carbon. What is my nucleophile? Well, I have two options. I have either OH or OCH3. In both cases, it's an oxygen that's acting as the nucleophile. Okay. If it attacks as a nucleophile, what charge would it become? Positive. Positive. Which then means it needs to get electrons from somewhere. And our choice is either taking those from hydrogen or taking those from carbon. Where would our nucleophile prefer to take electrons from? Hydrogen because <clears throat> it's the difference in electronegativity between those. Ultimately, what our comparison is, is that hydrogen is less electronegative than carbon. That means we should take the electrons away from the hydrogen, which means the group that is attached is ROCH3, and we end up with C as our answer. Kind of make sense? Uh, just make things easier on me. All right, next one. What changed? Type of reaction. We have an addition. An addition of what? 
H and OH. Okay. Which of those reagents supply H and OH? Sucks. Try again. We need more information. All of them give us H and OH. Okay. So let's take a closer look. We've got H2O and H+. Plus. A neutral species and an acid. Okay. Mercury, God, I hope this isn't the answer. With H2O, God, I hope this isn't the answer. T oh, geez, I hope this isn't the answer. HBr, which is strong acid and... Hmm, can I get a strong acid and a strong base in the same environment? No, that's a pretty questionable answer. Okay. It is a followed by, but it's still a questionable situation. Okay. So now, how would we go through and evaluate? Well, I already said two answers that I said, God, I hope it isn't this one. So I'm going to hope that it isn't that one. I'm going to start with a guess. H plus comes in, reacts with the double bond to give me my product. Oh, you jerk. I knew I should have stopped writing. We ended up with CH3, 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 CH. Why would I put the hydrogen at the end? Least substituted, so we could try and remember Markovnikov nonsense, or, heard someone saying it, more stable carbocation. What do I have? a secondary carbocation, and I should immediately be screaming Rearrange. rearrangements. Okay. Do I want a rearrangement? No. no, I want the OH to attack at that position to get me that product. As soon as I have a rearrangement, do I have that? No. no. So what happens? That's not the answer, and now I'm crying softly to myself because I have to know something about those reagents. Okay. So I can go back and look at both of those and try and come up with something to grab a hold of. I personally would probably grab a hold of the sodium borohydride. Okay. Why the sodium borohydride? What is particularly interesting about that reagent? H minus. Okay. So going back to my structure, I would expect to put the positive... Ah, stupid erasers... I would still expect the chemistry to align with the negative at the end and the positive hydrogen in our middle. Okay, so I might say H negative, that would put the hydrogen there, and uh, that's not the answer either. Okay, so I might eliminate that, and it ends up being for the wrong reason. If we go through and look at B, hydroxide, where would we expect to put the hydroxide? At the positive. Okay. So having very little comprehension of what that first region is doing, I end up falling down the wrong path. Okay? This is why you have to understand something about the chemistry of those molecules. What is the particular chemistry that's happening out of both of those? The mercury goes through and forms the mercuronium ion. Okay? which is then broken open by the nucleophile, which in this case happens to be our water. Where does the nucleophile attack? The place that forms the most stable carbocation because great leaving group. Okay. So our water would come in and attack. Oh, interesting. That's actually attacking in the appropriate space. Why would I use the mercury reagent over H plus and water? No rearrangements. Remember when we talked about it? I said, if you think rearrangements are a possibility, you should pick mercury. There's a reason I told you. There's the answer. Okay. What happens after that? The borohydride comes back and kicks out the mercury. Okay. What happens in the case of boron? It does the opposite chemistry because the boron acts as the electrophile, dumping a negative hydride onto the structure at that positive carbon. 
hydroxide comes in and kicks off the boron, uh, placing the OH at the terminal position as opposed to the internal position. Okay. Questions about that? Is there no problem with the peroxide and the uh, hydroxide? The peroxide is not a strong acid. They're actually used to activate to initiate the whole cleavage of the borane from your carbon. Okay. There, are, there is a mechanistic slide further back that you could look at if you wanted to. And I can talk to you about that after class, too. Questions on that one? Uh, I think that was question four now. What happens in question four? Go through and look. What am I reacting? Bromine. Yeah, I would probably literally skip this question. I am having the bromine react with the alkene to form the bromonium ion. What I would probably do is fix the orientation of this when I went through and did the reaction. I want to put the bromine up high. So what I would do is draw this as a CH3H. There's my double bond. H, CH2, CH3. Okay. So what I've done is taken that double bond and just turned it on edge. So the pi bond is reacting either above or below. I personally would always draw the, draw the above. Okay. It's really starting to become irritating. I'd have my bromonium ion that I would quickly then say the next bromine has to come in from the back side. Kicking that bromine up. I end up with a bromine up and a bromine down. Okay. The other option, the reaction went the other direction okay, and looked at that result. Okay. The meso answers I would eliminate pretty much outright by looking, oh, I, I eliminated them outright by looking at the reaction because I had some idea of what was happening with the chemistry. Now that we've drawn it out, can I possibly have a meso compound? No, there's no internal plane of symmetry. So the meso answers are gone. What about the last two? Okay. So this is going all the way back to chapter 5 or 6, whatever it was, and overlaying all sorts of fun. You're looking at your chiral and optical activity now overlaid on top of all of the reactions in those dynamics. Okay. So I could end up with this as the possible product. The other possible product would be bromines being potentially up, looking at our then enantiomers. Okay. I still personally, not confident with stereochemistry, I would draw them both out and I would line them up right next to each other and I would say what is the relationship between these. Okay. Whether you want to do that or not is entirely up to you, but I, if you looked at how I would solve this, I would draw both those structures and I would line them up and see what their relationship is. Okay. Which intermediate is involved in the reaction shown? Okay. This is one that for sure when I first took the test we never talked about carbenes. I had no clue what a carbene was. So we need to look at our structures and try and evaluate what's going on within it. Okay. What changed? Reactants to products. I lose a pi bond and... Mm, I would avoid saying formed a three-membered ring, but it did happen. I would reference it more as formation of two sigma bonds. Okay. By breaking the pi bond, how many bonds could I make? conservation of energy, mass, all that fun stuff. If I break one pi bond, I should be able to make one bond, period. So something else has to be going on. If I take those electrons out and put them into a location to make a new sigma bond, cool, that's the new sigma bond. Where did the other sigma bond come from? I need more electrons. I can't possibly make that bond. So what does that mean that reagent must supply? 
electrons. So I would go through and look at my answers and say, where do I have electrons? Or where do I not have electrons? Carbocation makes absolutely no sense. Okay? That species must supply electrons to get this reaction to occur. Radical, this is again one of those things where I'd cross my fingers and hope and pray and hope that that was not the right answer and hope I could somehow come up with something else over here. Both of those give me electrons. Okay, so now I've got to evaluate this carefully. That species can come and bring electrons to make one of those sigma bonds. The other sigma bond is made by doing what? Accepting electrons from the pi bond. To accept electrons, what has to be true? It must have a place to put those electrons. Does C give me that place? No. no. C has a full octet on the carbon. It cannot accept more electrons. Or sorry, that's not C, that's B. So B can't possibly be correct. I'd now kind of be stuck between C and A, and I'd look at A and be like, well, that doesn't make sense because that just looks weird. But I'd think back to go, oh, Mike talked about this. Okay. Or I could go back and say, two sigma bonds means how many electrons? What was that, Joey? Four. Four. Why? Two electrons in each orbital. How many electrons does the pi bond supply? Two. Which means I need two more. If I take a look at C, it only gives me one more. Which means, not C, A is my answer. Okay. You do not have to look at them and know the answer outright. It's thinking about processing and working your way through. Okay. Is there another approach to this? Yeah. You've got a strong base here. What can that strong base do? React with something acidic. Is the alkene giving up a hydrogen to form the product? No. no. So it can't be the acid, which then means the other one had better act as the acid. Okay. Which would then mean it needs to become a carbanion. We remove the hydrogen, it becomes a carbanion. That could help us out because D and C then immediately out the gate. We already got rid of C without having to deal with all that other weird stuff. Oh crap, it's a radical counting things. Acid base chemistry. Okay. Then trying to decide how would we get B or A from this? How do we get B? Carbon had to take electrons away from the chlorine. That's the only way B becomes a possible answer. Can it do that? Why not? Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. B doesn't make sense. When all other answers are wrong, the one you're left with is it. Okay? No matter how improbable. So you could look at it, and I think that's how I solved the question originally. It was like, well, what the hell is this thing? Well, everything else is wrong. Oh, well. Move on. Okay? So I was going to do a quiz on this last part, but I'm definitely out of time. I still have time, but just not enough time for a quiz. For those of you being like, yay, let's leave. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, a little roar to end the class with. <clears throat> Most reactive thing? Our oxygen oxygen bond. Okay. Which you should know from actually a couple places. MCPBA, our peroxy, when we're looking at making our uh, epoxide, and from the radical video that you all watched over the weekend. Okay. So we form. A peroxy species. We've got the radical floating around. What does that radical want? Electrons. electrons. Where are their electrons? Pi bonds. Pi bonds. So? 
But a double bond has how many electrons in it? Two. Two. How many electrons have I shown move from that double bond? One. One. So if something is missing, I need to show where that other electron goes. Why would I show it going to the middle and not to the end? Why is it more stable? Treat it the same way as you would treat a carbocation. And we now have a secondary radical. Are radicals stable? What does it do? Reacts with the most available thing that it can track down, which would be likely a pi bond. Pi bond found where? What's the hmm? I now have a terminal radical. Do I like terminal radicals? No. What's the relationship between those two structures? Resonance. Why would I favor the red one over the blue one? Stability of the pi bond. The red one has a more stable pi bond because it's internal. The blue one has a more stable radical because it's internal. Both are possible structures to exist. Both of them are still radicals. What can happen? Keep can keep reacting. What is it likely, most likely to encounter? Very, very rarely do we ever encounter another OR. Very typically what we would encounter would be another alkene. So what happens? Is that the one I drew? Now what happens? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Is it more like it will attack the initial alkene or the radical that it forms? Yeah, doing the exact substitution, I think I screwed that one up. What do we still have? Radical. radical. What can that radical do? React. Resonance. Or? React with, a pi bond. React with another pi bond, which will generate another, structure. another radical structure that is <coughs> bigger than the one we started with. What kind of reaction have we initiated? A polymerization. <coughs> okay. Radicals tend to be used in polymerization reactions Think of uh, PET, which is polyethylene terephthalate. The polyethylene is radical synthesis. PVC, polyvinyl chloride, is radical synthesis. Okay. All of those are done through a radical synthesis, much the same as this. How do we control the length of that and the material properties? by controlling the concentration of each of those species. If I do a one-to-one -one relationship of the, per, of the radical initiator and the alkene, you're very true. Very likely the radical initiator will quench and I end up with a very short polymer chain. Okay, what if I want a really long one? Do very small amounts of the initiator in tons of the alkene monomer. That structure then grows a lot more extensively. Okay, I will do a 10-minute whirlwind polymer uh, lecture on Wednesday, I promise, 10 minutes, and then we will full-on go